you know, we, we go through a certain part of it and then we end with a question that will be resolved next time. Hopefully, you know, the, the you know, uh, what is it, Batman is sitting next to dynamite with his hands cuffed behind him and will he get out? And you kind of have an idea he probably will get out, you know, because you look in a TV guide and you see that, that there's another episode next week. All right. But I like to leave with cliffhangers. And the cliffhanger we left you with last time was you have a bunch of possible ways to categorize any amount of information. All right, or, or any kind of information. We talked about, again, the process. And to review the process up to this point, in the first phase, essentially you're defining who your hypothetical audience is, and you're actually creating three representative people and giving them a little bit of a backstory so you can hopefully view things through their eyes. You're also defining the goals, both for those people and for the organization. So that's the strategy section. You decide what you're going to do and, and why you're going to do it. And it's funny, you know, this is one of those things that like people might say, like, isn't this obvious? Of course you're going to do that. Well, you see a lot of websites where it doesn't appear that people went through this exercise because they have no idea what their users really need to serve their goals. And therefore you just get a pile of stuff that you got to sift through. All right. So that's the first stage, defining the goals. The second part, the scope or the requirement stage, you define a list of stuff that's going to be on your site. And it is not a, it's not a differentiated list, it's just a, a, a pile of stuff that you're going to put on your, your site. All right? You haven't decided how you're going to break it up. And like I said last time, you're not going to have a separate page for each requirement. You can group some things together and, and et cetera. By the same token, you're probably not going to have everything all on one page either. So you're going to take your requirements and figure out how to organize it. Now, in the example we gave last time, we talked about jazz music, and we threw out in five minutes' time six or seven different ways that we could organize the information if we wanted to. We mentioned some of them as we, we uh, said organize it by name by you know alphabetical order organize it by era organize it by style organize it by instrument organize it by gender and so on and so forth now we have all these alternatives to do how do we decide what the right one to do is how do we decide the best way to organize our data into separate pages you use your goals all right, that's one thing that would, would weigh heavily on it, is see which organization tends to um, allow for people to use their goals. What's well, another, another way to maybe say the same thing? Maybe word it just a little differently. you would use the method that you think your users would understand better. You'd use the method of organizing it the way that you think your users are going to most or best relate to. And I'll give you a classic example of maybe how one school could do it versus another school. All right, A college could divide their website by the different departments that it's in, uh, that, that's in the college. You could, you could have the admissions department, the bursar, the financial aid department, the um, campus services department, the business division, the engineering division, and so on and so forth. All right? That's the way the college is organized, right? If we put up our organization chart, we'd have an organization chart, and, and, and this big organization is divided. You know, there's Dr. Church at the top, and then there's a couple people under him, and a few people under them, and so on and so forth. Another way to do it would be like we saw LC's page defined, where we have 
a new student section, an existing student section, a community section, a faculty staff section. Which way seems to be better and why? Which way seems to be a better way to do it? To divide the website up by department or divide the website up by type of student or, or type of visitor? Let's put it that way. Yes? Type of visitor. Why is that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, each, each visitor, they may not know anything about the way the college is organized, right? But everyone visiting the site knows, are they a prospective student? Are they a current student? All right? And so on. Am I a fac faculty staff? So I go to the website, you know, I go here and, and I say, well, am I a current student? No, I know that I'm faculty staff, so I know what link to click on. You're not going to get confused about that. If, for example, you divided it by department, there'd be some questions. Some of the departments might be obvious, but there'd be some questions that you wouldn't really know the answer to unless you knew about the organization of LCC in some detail. For example, what does the bursar do? Who knows? I think I know what they do. You for yeah, I think the bursar is the one that, that you pay, all right? But there are, you know, uh, there's a dozen people in the room and really only a couple probably know what a bursar is, all right? And so on down the line, all right? Computer, if you wanted to be a computer programmer, let's say, if you wanted to, or you wanted to be a web developer, where would you look for web development information if it was broken down by department? Google. Okay, Google. All right. Where would you look for it if it was broken down by department? There is a neat trick, that, that I, and I'll talk about it in a second. We actually did. Okay, I did. Yeah, how you can use a, you can use Google search to search within a site. And that would be, that would be a good approach. But, you know, our aim is to create sites where you don't need to do that. Because a lot of folks don't know how to do that. Let me, let me ask you this. What division is the web development degree in? It's in business. Do we have another answer? Engineering. All right. Do we have another answer? Computer information systems. All right, all of these answers are kind of right, all right, and let me explain to you why. Until this year, web development was in the business division. As of this year, we have been, become part of the engineering division, and we're in the engineering and information technology division. So could you imagine if you attended here three years ago, and you remember that, oh yeah, Zellers, he's in the business division. Let's look up to see if there's any new web development courses. And you went in under the business division and you didn't see any web development courses. It would be like, what, did they drop that program? You know, you'd be very confused um, about what to do. Um, so currently we're in the engineering and information technology. CISS is right, but that's not really a division. That's sort of a... I, I don't know if they describe them that way on campus, but that's sort of a department within a division. All right. Um, so you might look for, hey, I know I took CISS 216. Let me look for the CISS division. Well, again, unless you know how our college is structured, you're not going to realize CISS is like a department within a division, not a division itself. So the bottom line is, is you would do it, you would organize your stuff, in a way that makes sense to users. So for this, even though this is a small website, as we shown with the Jazz example, for even a small website, you can think of a couple alternative ways to do it, to organize your information, and I'd ask you to do that. So, getting back to the Jazz example, 
Let's see what I chose. This is a cliffhanger, right? I know. There's probably someone watching this video in Canada that's like, you know, I've been waiting since last Tuesday to find out what he picked because I don't have access to Angel. Whereas the people in this class, of course, already know what I picked because you've reviewed all those documents in detail. Okay. Well, I can, I can, I can hope, right? All right, let's see. Let's go under the project. Let me open up this guy and this guy. What? Oh. All right, here's the things that we looked at last time. Here's the structure, and it's a little hard to see this. You could expand it, but the structure is there's going to be a home page, and there's going to be a page based on each instrument. All right, there's going to be a trumpet page, a saxophone page, piano page, bass, drums, other, and then I think I have, what, an index and links. I'm using what's called a simple hierarchy on this. Now, this is sort of like the tip, uh, a, a, a tip for you, a spoiler alert. Most of you are going to use a simple hierarchy similar to this. Now, you might have sub-pages underneath that, so you might go a little bit deeper in the hierarchy, but for small websites, this is the way to go. There's other more complicated sort of arrangements for things if you have a whole lot of data if you have a whole lot of pages on your site. For example, and here's what, here's what I thought a few folks were going to say, that you could actually give, you could actually organize your site a couple different ways and let people get at material through different links or different methods. And that's, that's valid when you have a, a whole lot of data because two, two reasonable people can, again, view things in different ways. All right, but for something as simple as this, a basic hierarchy is going to be it. You're going to have a, a top-level page, which is your home page. You're then sort of conceptually underneath that, you're going to have a series of pages. And then underneath one of them or two of them, you might have some other pages going down. So I'm using a simple hierarchy for the site. Given the nature of the site, it's really the only structure that makes sense. Another example would be uh, of, a, of a, uh, uh, a, a, a structure for it, would be a linear structure, where you go from page one to page two to page three to page four to page five. For many websites, that's probably not a good idea, right? Because you don't want to force people to go through five pages to get to the one page they want to. What might be an example of a site where the, pa the pages are organized sort of in a sequence that you have to follow. I would say, I'll bet many of you fill this out once a year. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking of an order form. An, say, an order Amazon, form. Right. right. Now, that might not be the entire site. That might be a portion of the site. But, yeah, that portion of the site would be that. I'm thinking of, like, I just recently filled out uh, for my kids the FAFSA, right? The FAFSA, you follow in sequence. You do this step, you do this step, you do this. It's a linear process that you're going through. Or, if I was going to try to teach you how to do something, I don't know, what, what's something I know how to do that, that doesn't relate to programming? To knit, all right? You can't step to step 10 
without going through step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So something where I was that, that, that needed to be viewed in a certain sequence, maybe I would have what's called a linear uh, structure, where it's this one and this one and this one and this one. But those are sort of rare. Uh, most websites, a simple hierarchy is probably a better fit. Then there's more complicated ones where there's like networks where things are hooked together in a variety of different ways and so on. But for the size of the site we're doing, a simple hierarchy will make sense. Now, organizing principle is a fancy way of saying what base, on what basis am I breaking down the information. And in this case, I'm doing it by instrument. All right? The reason I'm doing it by instrument is that if you're going to know anything about a musician that you like, it's going to be what instrument they play. All right? You may not know, for example, Bill Evans, a great jazz piano player. You may not know what style he would be considered. You may not even know what era that he belongs to especially given the fact that he recorded over uh, a number of years, all right, from the 50s at least to the 80s. So which era we fit into. But if you, if you know and like Bill Evans, you know that he's a piano player, all right? That, that one's, if you know the person, if you know the musician, you're going to know that they're a piano player. And so if you want to listen to other music similar to them, it would make sense to send you to a page about piano players. Where you can say, well, this guy is similar to Bill Evans, or something along those lines. All right. Likewise, again, there's the problems of eras. You know, there are there are musicians. You know, Sonny Rollins is a great mu uh, example of a musician who is literally still recording today, and his first recordings were probably in the 1940s. So if I broke it down chronologically, where do you put him? It's confusing. Do you put where he started? Do you put his most recent? Do you put where he was at, say, the peak of his career? That's confusing. All right. But, again, if you know him and you heard a recording by him and you like it and you want to get more like it, you know he plays a saxophone. All right. The bottom line is, whatever you choose, however you choose to do as far as your organization goes, should be done deliberately. And you should at least consider other options. All right? I have not encountered a topic yet where there weren't at least a couple of options of ways to organize the data. Now, one of those may be better. But if you simply go with the first thing that you think of, you might miss something that would be um, a better choice. When I was actually doing this, I spent, a, I spent, I actually did that exercise. I thought if I was creating a jazz site for novice, what would I do? And I thought, would I do it by style? Would I do it by era? And I thought of all the reasons why, oh, those don't sound good. And then I hit on the idea of, of by instrument, which I, I think would probably be the best way. All right. Now, what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you in this section to define how you're breaking down your data and define why. And implicit in that is comparing it to at least one other alternative. All right. So, if you are doing Let's say, let's go through, let's think of another example. Let's say I'm going through um, tourist attractions in Ohio. All right. What are some ways I could divide that up? Maybe tourist is the wrong word. Um, entertainment or recreational. Is probably the best word that I can think of. What are some ways I could define divide that information up? By region. By region. Yeah, exactly. Could be like the Cleveland area, the Toledo area, the Columbus area, or divided the state into quadrants, or by county. That would be one way. What's another way I could divide it up? 
by the types of attractions. Amusement parks. All right, you have Kings Island, Cedar Point, and if Geauga Lake is still open, you have that. Is Geauga Lake? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, whatever. Oh, yeah, okay, Six Flags, there you go. Types of entertainment, like for adults? Right, the, the, the people that it would appeal to. In other words, um, you know, families, people with young kids, people with teens, um, single people, couples, um, people that are, uh, live an active lifestyle, all right? Again, you could, you know, th these are two very reasonable ways that we could. I wouldn't put a clear winner in this case, all right? Either one of those could be good. But the point is, is do it deliberately. Think about it and see what makes the most sense to your hypothetical users. And that will be your organizing principle, all right? Now, you certainly could combine organizing principles. So, for example, you could have Northern Ohio, and then underneath that have outdoor recreation, um, museums, concert halls, and so on. And do the same thing for Central Ohio or Southern Ohio. So you could, you could, you could sort of combine the two if you, if you wanted to, if there was enough data to justify it. So what I want you to do is I want you to decide how you're going to organize your stuff. I want you to explain why you picked that. Then I want you to do an organizational chart which looks like this. Now in this case, I have a relatively flat structure. The other option is a deep structure. All right? They both have their advantages and disadvantages. All right? Something like this, you run the risk of having so many options of links on a page that people lose track of where to go. If you have a bunch of clicks going down a hierarchy, you run the risk that it takes 20 clicks to get to wherever you want to end up. So some balance of that is, is good. All right, so we're, we're winding down. We've done three of the four. The next step is called the skeleton. And this drawing didn't turn out right in words, so let me sketch what I mean by this. A skeleton is what's called a wireframe. For the skeleton section, you create what's called a wireframe. And all a wireframe is, is simply a very high level overview of how the page will be structured. So again, if you remember way back when we started this process, I talked about how we are moving from very vague things like goals, personas, to a little more specific. Well, what is the content that we're going to have on this page? To a little more specific. Well, how, what, how, how many pages are we going to have? How are we going to break down that content? To even more specific, what's an individual page going to look like? All right. In the skeleton phase, this wireframe, though, is just really an overview. So for small sites, there's a couple of pretty typical skeletons. One is to have a banner on the top of the page that contains information about what the site's about. You know, the name of the organization, maybe a brief explanation of the purpose of the site. So, beginning jazz listeners might be a banner that I put there, and I might have a paragraph explaining the purpose of the site. Again, I would argue, I don't care if you're the most famous corporation of the world. It should be obvious when people visit your site who the site is for and what's it about. All right. There could be a logo here, company logo. There could be a little paragraph explaining some information about it. But the point is, is no one should visit your site without knowing what the site is about. All right. Then, a lot of times you'll have navigation over here. The 
Then you're liable to have a content area over here. Then maybe a footer over here. This is a very typical layout for a small site. All right. Banner navigation content and footer. And this is a wireframe. And this is the only level of detail we need to go on this wireframe. All right. We don't have to specify what the links are in the navigation or, or whatever. We just specify that this is going to be the navigation section. All right. Some variations of this, well, let me just throw some out and maybe talk about the situation. You may have a banner section. You may have the navigation extending horizontally instead of vertically. All right. You may then have the content area over here, and then you might have the footer. For a little bit bigger site, you might have a banner, a main navigation, and a sub navigation, and then content and a footer. We have that on LC site. If we look, yeah. Can you explain this term you just used, big? So does big describe the size of the entity, how many things you're trying to communicate? How do we yeah, understand that? Big, big, would, big, would, big in essence would be a lot of pages. You know, uh, when I use the word, when I talk about a big website, I talk about a, a website that had a lot of pages. And specifically, uh, a website that had a lot of different kinds of pages. All right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's probably the best metric I would have for that. Yeah, go ahead. So the example I'm thinking of is, since you part of this course is you've asked us to look at other sites and look at the source code. Uh -huh. And so I see these things now where I'm looking at the source code and I'm seeing multiple style sheets being used in multiple segments in the page. So you go to that first page, you see different style sheets leading you to different things on the navigation. Right. This is the kind of thing you're talking about when you're talking about big. All these concepts connecting together for the user um, experience. Yeah, that 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 would be that would be another example of it, um, where it, it's not necessarily well. Yeah, the big, I guess, big is a function of the size, the number of pages, and the relative complexity. Now, one thing that you have to be um, concerned with. All right, when you are looking at code that other people use. How do you know they did a good job on the code? You don't, right? The other thing to be concerned about is in some cases people are using either a content management system such as WordPress for simplicity purpose because they're not a coder and WordPress does a lot of stuff for you, all right? Or server-side scripting languages use, where essentially a program writes the page for you, for you. You don't write the page manually. And in either of those cases, those two things can produce code that doesn't necessarily like look right or looks a little off or looks a little odd. So that's another consideration as well. You know. So again, you know, it, 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 it's kind of funny, you know. Um, you know, you, you can learn things from looking at the code, but again, you know, there's no guarantee they did it right. I can find pages that if I viewed the source and looked at the example, I'd say, don't, please, don't ever you do that, you know. And, but they did it. Um, uh, here, here's just a tiny classic example of that. Let's go to Google's page, Google's home page. And let's view the page source. Now, you might say to yourself, didn't 
didn't he spend a fair amount of time talking about structuring your code in a way that makes it readable? This, even as someone that knows coding, isn't particularly readable. Now, compare my bank account with the bank account of the folks that created Google. All right. Obviously, they're on the ball in some respects, you know, because they're doing a lot better than me. So, what's going on here? Was I lying when I told you it's good practices to do that? Why do you think Google has such tough to read code? They don't want you, maybe, but probably not. Because you could still reverse that. You could still figure out a lot of stuff from that if you wanted to take the time and all that. What do you think another reason is? How many, how many people visit Google every single day for one thing or another? I'd say a lot of people do. All right? And a lot of people visit multiple times. And it's not just true for technical folk. It's true for probably most people. Most people, if they're on the web, they will probably hit Google sometime that day. Is, is, is a say, that, that would be the way I would bet, anyhow. All right? So Google is very interested in keeping down their file sizes. Because by sending a smaller file, all right, they're saving a lot of bandwidth. All right, and even though they have powerful servers, hey, they're trying to squeeze out as much power as they can because Google is a very popular site that receives tons of traffic. So if they can make the code a little bit smaller, well, they'll buy their programmers a pair of glasses, all right, so that they can read this code. They probably have some method where the programmer writes it one way and then they compress it. Um, to, to be like this. So the, the developer probably doesn't see this. There's probably a process where they get rid of extraneous spaces and all that. All right. So those are all things to keep in mind when you're viewing other people's source codes. Are there some other considerations? Like that's a very obvious case where there's another consideration. But to, to answer your initial question, when I'm talking about big, I'm typically talking about probably like a lot of pages and a lot of different kinds of pages. All right. Oh, I was going to show you LC's page with the sub nav. This is what I mean about a sub-navigation. And it's not that way on the home page, but if I go to the current students page, notice how this navigation stays the same everywhere I go. That you would term the main navigation. It's constant across all pages. But this navigation over here on the side is going to be different depending on what section of the site you're on. So notice in this case, for current students, it says academic resources, academic offerings, academic support, paying for college, and so on. If I go, for example, to community services, educational opportunities, alumni services, learning centers, career and employment. If I go to faculty, a directory, instructional excellence, tools, training and workshops. If I go to future students, there's slightly different. So within a section, that stays the same. So like if I'm in the paying for, I, I stand corrected. But each one of these has their own basic sub-navigation. Whereas for a given section of the site, um, it looks different. So getting back to the examples I'm drawing of wireframes, I might have on a larger site, whereas I had a lot of this going on, maybe I had two or three pages, and then underneath each of those three pages, I had three or four other pages. I might have, then, the need to have a main navigation and a sub-navigation, where the main navigation would stay constant across the site and the sub-navigation would change. Sometimes sites have sidebars. 
stuff that's pretty constant on every page that isn't a header or isn't a navigation. Like LC has news, for example. So if I was going to draw a wireframe for their site, it might look like this. There's a header. There is a main navigation. There's a sub-navigation. There's the main content information. There's a sidebar, which is typically like news. And then there's a footer. All right, so if we look at this page, this page sort of fits that rule. All right, actually, if I wanted to do the wireframe for this page, really, it's a little different than I, what I've shown because there's like a big graphic here. There's a sidebar, there's content, and there's a sub-navigation. as we see here, they typically have announcements here that, that are relevant, you know. Um, late starting spring classes, hours of operation, career week, graduation, and so on. And that's going to be constant on every page. Likewise, the links to the social media. All right. Now, again, for a smaller site, you may or may not need any of those things. For a smaller site where you only have, like, uh, we ha uh, like the, the, the requirements say, I think, something like six to eight pages, eight, something like that, you probably don't need a sub-navigation. You probably, a main navigation is probably all that you need. All right? And... Do you want a sidebar? Well, maybe. Maybe there's a need for you to have a sidebar for some reason. You definitely want a footer. You definitely want a navigation. You definitely want a content area. How you choose to arrange them is really up to you. All right? Um, and I suppose it's possible under some circumstances that some of your pages would have a sub-nav. Now, here's the thing, and this is the thing that, that students sometimes have a hard time to understand, is that there's not one wireframe per page, necessarily. There's a wireframe per pages that are structured the same. So, for example, when looked at on a high level, the business and innovation page has the same layout as the current students page. The specifics of it are different. There's different, different links in the sub-navigation. There's a different picture there. All right, the announcements are the same. The main nav's the same. The banner's the same. But the basic structure is the same. So let's look at how many wireframes you might need for this site. The home page has a totally different structure than any of the other pages. So you need a wireframe for that. These sort of top-level pages, current students, future students, business and industry, those all sort of have the same basic layout. So you could have one wireframe for all of those pages. When we finally get around to getting to the pages with the main content, There's also going to be a bunch of pages that look like this, that have this structure. So, in, in a nutshell, and we could dig deeper to see if we found a, a fourth one here, but what I've seen so far is three wireframes. Even though there's a whole bunch of pages that look like that, there's really only three basic structures. The home page, the sort of top-level navigation pages, 
for each section, current student, future student, and so on. And then finally, the specific content pages. So don't think just because you're going to have eight pages means you're going to have eight wireframes. In fact, that's probably bad, right? Why is it bad? If, why, why did I say it's bad to say that I would have eight wireframes if I had eight pages? Yeah, that, that you, you want some level of consistency because if each page is structured differently, that's going to confuse the heck out of users. And users are going to think they somehow ended up on a different site. So, even within the different wireframes, notice certain parts of the page stay constant. That gives the user the assurance that, hey, I'm on the same page here. The layout changed a little bit, but it didn't change a lot. So, for many students, many students, will get, many students could get by with one wireframe. I know that's very exciting, right? Because that makes this part of it easy. All right? You might need two wireframes. You might need a wireframe for your home page, because that's going to have a different layout. It's, it's, it's pretty common for a home page to have a different layout than the rest of the pages on the site. And then one for the rest of the pages. You might even have three wireframes, where you have a home page, you have your standard content page, then you have a page that is sort of an oddball page. I'm thinking maybe like a photo gallery or something like that. Maybe a photo gallery, you have a set of thumbnails and a picture on the bottom or something like that. All right. If you want to have more than three wireframes, if you think you need more than three wireframes, I would suggest talking to me because you probably don't. All right. That's just my observation. That, that typically for projects of this size, one is pretty common, two is pretty common, three is probably less common but not unheard of, four, hmm, you might want to step back and think about it a little bit more. All right. That is the wireframe section. So you need to develop a wireframe for each of the different basic layouts. You'll have probably one to three of these. The last phase, and this is always entertaining because on occasion, oops, I have people that simply repeat my words to say I'm not going to create a prototype. I'm allowed to say that because I'm the instructor in this course. All right. This is an example. All right. When I graded myself, I overlooked it and gave myself credit for the prototype anyhow. All right. Because I know that I would have done a bang up job if I did actually make a, a prototype. For students in this class, you do need to make a prototype. All right. I just didn't want to make a prototype at this point in time. In fact, really the next few classes we'll talk about. Now that we have this design with the wireframes and, and the structure chart and all that, how do we actually make pages? Now what do I mean by a prototype? What does, a, what does the word prototype mean? Or is there a synonym for prototype that anyone can think of? Beta, uh, sometimes that term is used as a beta version of something. Prototype actually is probably even a little earlier than a beta, but a beta is, is a good, good alternative way of putting it. Another way? A mock-up. A mock-up, all right. Another way to say it? Would be a model, all right. Now, all these things, when you talk about a model, when you talk about a mock-up, even when you talk about a beta version of something, you're talking about something that you know is not finished. All right? You don't have to present to me as your prototype perfect, polished web pages. But you should give me enough so I get an idea of how the pages are going to look and how the pages are going to interact with each other. So, 
You don't have to have all your content written. You don't have to have all your pages on your site done. You don't have to have all your images decided on. You could put placeholder images in or whatever. But it should be enough that I can look at it and say, yeah, I think this when this is done, when you finish this up, this will be good. Or, no, I want you to reconsider and, and do something different. All right. Remember why we are creating these documents. You might think, well, we're creating these documents because they're worth a lot of points. All right. And that's true in this class. But in the real world, why do they create these documents? They create them for two reasons. First reason is there's the whole measure twice, cut once philosophy. All right. The more time you spend planning, the more effective you're going to be making something. All right. Good websites don't happen by accident. Good websites happen by, plan by planning. There's a famous curve, and I show this in almost every single class that I teach, um, about the cost of making a change to a piece of software. And the curve looks like this. This is the cost. This is the phase of the project. Planning, building, testing, live. Depending on how you score it, there's four or five different phases. The cost to make a change goes up. And it goes up like that. Mathematics fans know that that's a curve that has a positive first derivative, I believe. If I remember, that's I think the one thing I remember from calculus class. What does that mean? It means it increases. Not only does the cost increase, it increases at an increasing rate. So it's not a linear increase. It doesn't just get more and more expensive. It gets more and more expensive, and the rate at which it gets more expensive is faster. What is the implication of this? The implication of this is if we can catch an oversight here, when we're planning it, it's going to be a lot easier to, to, to fix and a lot less expensive to fix or change than if we catch the air somewhere later on the, on the line. This is something that has been true since the first day people wrote software. All right? And I would argue that it also applies to web development as well. It applies to any sort of software development. If you're talking about mobile development, it doesn't matter. This curve in one form or another applies. So therefore, we're going to spend a lot of time planning. All right? Now, I've heard people say that I do this, I plan it and all that, but it's all in here. All right? What's wrong with that kind of thinking? It falls out. Yeah, it falls out. It may not be all in here. You may think it's all in there, but until you sit down and put it on paper, just like when I go grocery shopping, sometimes I think my grocery list is in, all up in here, but every single time when I get home, when I do that, I realize I forgot six different things. All right. The other thing is it's very difficult, unless you can do the Vulcan mind meld, to share information that is stored up here. Now, who do you want to share information with? You want to share information with the people that are asking you to develop the website. All right. You may talk about what the website is going to have and all that. And you, you know, but when you set it down on paper, that's something that they can look at and scrutinize and say, yeah, I like the way that looks. Or no, I don't like the way that looks. All right. You also may need to communicate it to people that you're working with in developing the site. Depending on the kind of site it is, um, you know, it could possibly be more than one person working on developing the site. So you want to be able to communicate to other people your team. And your team includes both the people that you're doing the site for and the people that are working with you to develop the site. All right, yes? Could we consider you also as an instructor and our customer? Yeah. So that we need to communicate to you our progress and where we're having challenges. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You'd want to consider me like as a customer in this case, where um, you know I'll provide feedback 
you know, I know you're making up the, 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 the um, goals and all that, but I can provide feedback to, uh, for those things. I encourage you to let me see the drafts that you make of this before they're due. They're not due for a few weeks, but as you start working about it, on it rather, the, um, the um, you know, I encourage you to, to, to send me what you have and so I can critique it in advance. The typical problem people have is being too vague. All right? I want information that's easy to look up. Well, yeah, of course you do. All right? But that doesn't really tell me much about the user goals to say that. What is the sort of information that your users are going to want to look up and, and so on? What are their goals? What do they want out of this? You know? Um, what, what do they want to achieve? Why have they visited your site? The more specific you can be, the better you can assess how good the design is and how good the, the final product is. Our task next week will be to develop sort of a template. And a template is sort of an actual HTML version of your wireframe. All right? And also to talk about visual language. Visual language is how things are communicated to us even without reading the words. All right? And when you look at web pages, there's a lot that gets communicated to us before we even understand a single word of it. All right? And that is done through what I would describe as visual language. All right? So that's where we'll pick up uh, next time. All right? See you in lab. Yes. You could use Greek text in the design, but not in the final version. So if you want to, if you say, hey, I'm going to have a paragraph about skiing here, and you're not ready to write that paragraph about skiing, you can put Greek text in. Um, because that's easy enough to explain to people. I will tell you that, that, you know, the more realistic you can make the prototype, the better off you're going to be. On the other hand, you don't want to take the time to finish the site and pass that off as a prototype because if you take that much time, if changes are required, then, well, you have to rework a lot of stuff too. So for the design, yes. For the final version, no. Yes? What if it's for the Greek market? <laughs> uh, then you need to hire a translator for me so that I can uh, assess it as correct.